They say that the apple never falls far from the tree, and it's certainly the case with Severin Cullis Suzuki, who is the daughter of David Suzuki. But Bioneers is a meritocracy, and while it gives us very special pleasure to feature such an illustrious family tree, Severin is here because she's one of the most uniquely gifted, passionate, and brilliant young environmental sheroes on the horizon. Severin started organizing and agitating when she was in kindergarten. Honest, organizing parades with kids on the block to save the wilderness, and fundraising by selling books from her parents' bookshelves. <laughs> At the age of nine, she founded the Environmental Children's Organization. At the age of 12, she delivered an impassioned address at the Rio Summit, attracting global attention. Since then, she's attended Yale University, appeared and participated in many TV programs, written widely on environmental issues, and worked closely with native peoples in British Columbia and the Amazon. A few years ago, she celebrated the millennium by cycling across Canada in a campaign for clean air, with her father David following in a hybrid support car, a symbol perhaps of the handoff of leadership to the new generation, and certainly a tribute to youthful stamina, lungs, and limbs. Severin has recently worked in a remote research station in the Amazon and served as a member of Kofi Annan's special advisory panel to the UN World Summit on Johannesburg. One of her large current endeavors is an internet-based think tank called the Skyfish Project, which offers a forum for a wide range of activists, especially young ones, to share visions for what kind of a future they want. Severin understands deeply that the most important task ahead is to raise awareness and shift perceptions and values, especially among the younger generations. When you experience the extraordinary vitality, wisdom, political creativity and commitment of this already seasoned veteran at the ripe old age of 23, you can feel in your bones that there is an extraordinary new generation poised to take our movements to new levels of effectiveness and help build a sane, sustainable, life-affirming future for us all. When you encounter the likes of Severin Cullis Suzuki, it's impossible not to feel hope that we have among us new leaders who will find ways of turning the tide. In introducing Severn, I'd like to first share with you her moving words that she delivered at the 92 Earth Summit in Rio, where she made quite a stir 11 years ago at the age of 12. She said, I'm only a child and I don't have all the solutions, but I want you to realize neither do you. You don't know how to fix the holes in the ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back from a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct, and you can't bring back a forest where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. In my country, we make so much waste. We buy and throw away, buy and throw away, yet northern countries will not share with the needy. Even when we have more than enough, we're afraid to share some of our wealth afraid to let go. You teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect each other, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not to be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the things you tell us not to do? My dad always says, you are what you do, not what you say. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. You grown-ups say you love us. I challenge you, please make your actions reflect your words. Please join me in welcoming Severin Cullis Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good crowd. <laughs> it's a great honor for me to be here, to be speaking to people like you, and, and to be sharing the stage with so many mentors and, and legends for me, really. 
I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I was born and raised in the province of British Columbia, a, a province, yeah? A province in Canada well known for our abundant resources and our natural beauty. Several of our small towns boast that they are the salmon capital of the world. We are famous for our massive cedars and spruce, our forest industry. We are famous for our incredible forests, our rich ocean, our snow-capped mountains, and thanks to them, we've become a world-class tourist destination. Tourism is now an economic staple. Our whale watching alone brings in over $100 million every year. Our identity, our very identity as a province is, is about the trees and the forest and the, and the oceans, so much so that our logo is Supernatural BC. Well, that's the postcard version of British Columbia. The province that I've come from today is not so glossy. Today our salmon, the lifeblood for the people on our coast, are in a decline so sharp that it verges on, on catastrophe and we are having similar problems in our logging industry. The capital city of our supernatural province, Victoria, has no sewage treatment whatsoever. But you know there's the ocean, so. Our resident orcas, the killer whales that people come from all over the world to see, have been identified as among the most toxic mammals on Earth. This summer was so hot and dry that our province was ravaged by hundreds of fires raging across our interior. Our city of Vancouver, which is renowned for how much rain we get, we're just a rainy, rainy city. We were so dry this summer that we had total watering bans because our water reservoir dropped below 30% for the first time ever. You don't have to be an old timer to recognize that our surroundings are changing. You just have to open your eyes. The violence of this is painful to witness. And the contrast of the incredible beauty and the potential of the natural world with its permanent destruction and what that means for people has pushed me my entire life to speak out about what's happening. And it's this dichotomy, I think, that brings us all together here today. Like all of you here, I'm a product of my childhood. And it was my childhood experience of this dichotomy, not only at home but abroad as well, that has shown me at once how privileged I've been to experience the natural world as I've grown up. Most kids now don't spend very much time in nature and that I have to work to make sure that other children are able to experience what I was able to experience. I grew up in the city of Vancouver and I spent most of my time as a child down at the intertidal zone playing in the tide pools. It was the best playground. From the beginning I learned that eating local is the best my grandparents live upstairs from, from my family, so all my life uh, we grew up eating the vegetables that Granddad grew for us in the garden. And we also would go fishing right in front of our house to catch smelts and flounders, which we would eat for breakfast. My parents took me and my sister Sarika camping and fishing all over our province of British Columbia. We also spent a lot of time with the First Nations people, of our province. First Nations are, is the Canadian term for Indians. We spent time with the Hiltzuk of Bella Bella, with the Quagyoth of Alert Bay, and especially with the Haida of Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands off the north coast of, of BC. After I graduated from high school, I spent a lot of time with uh, each summer with a very special Haida woman who took me out onto the reefs and onto the ocean, and she showed me that when the tide is out, the table is set. And she showed me how to catch, sea, how to spear sea urchins, and how to catch rock scallops, and how to catch halibut, 
and find cod and spring salmon. But at the same time as having all these great experiences, I was also witnessing some serious destruction. And at home in, in BC, if you drive up any, any major highway, you can see the clear cuts and the landslides caused by our, our very unsustainable logging practices. And at home in the city of Vancouver, we started to catch flounders full of tumors because of our pollution. And in Haida Gwaii, I saw how interconnected humans are with their environment. Now that the fishing industry is failing, unemployment is a huge problem in the islands. So I also grew up very aware of the fact that the environment that I love is under some pretty intense pressure. And as it, as it fails, so do small communities. When I was about eight, my little sister was about five, my parents became involved in a, in a fight in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. My dad did a lot of traveling. Um, he, he is still a TV broadcaster and uh, was doing some work in Brazil. And he had met an amazing indigenous person, a Kayapo man called Payacan. And Payacan was leading the fight to stop the building of a series of hydroelectric dams. And these dams would flood out not only thousands of hectares of rainforest, but many native villages. And a lot of these native villages didn't even know that these plans were being made. So Payakan was organizing these people to come together to protest the building of these dams. In the end, the coalition of indigenous peoples won, and the dams were not built. The world... For now, anyway. This victory led to death threats for Payakan. And as you can imagine, when you get death threats in Brazil, you have to take them seriously. And he decided the best thing would be to leave his country and to bring his family with him to let things cool down a little bit. And he knew my parents in Canada. And so Payakan decided he was going to come to Canada with his family. They stayed with us for six weeks, and it was an incredible experience. The first day that they were here, they were staying uh, in Vancouver, they were staying in our basement, and my mom went down to, to check on them, see how they were doing, and she found the little girls, there were three daughters, one, four, and five. And the two little girls, oh, and Tanya, the four and five year olds, were playing on the fire, uh, playing on the floor. They had made a fire in the fireplace and then pulled the coals out onto the hardwood floor and just were playing with it. See, they're used to, to mud floors, of course. But in the end, we ended up becoming great friends with them. And so they invited us to visit with them in their village of Ookri. And so the next summer, that summer, my mom, my dad, my sister, and I traveled down to the tiny village of Aokri, deep in the Shingu Valley of the lower Amazon. And sometimes you can point to defining moments in your life. And I know that perhaps many of you out there have had pivotal moments that have changed you in your direction. Maybe, that's, maybe those moments are why you are here today. And what that trip when I was nine catalyzed my involvement in speaking out about environmental issues in a very big way. And I'm speaking to you here because of it. So I'd like to show you some slides of that adventure. This is the Kayapo village of Aokri. You can see there's a river on the right and an airstrip on the left. These are the only two ways to get into the village. It takes about an hour Oh, flying over the rainforest or two weeks by canoe. This is Aokri. As you can see, it's very traditional. People wear feathers and, uh, well, mostly paint for clothing. You can see the houses are made out of mud and thatch. While we were there, the women held a three-day women's festival. And there, this is the third day. It was the most elaborate. The women are wearing headdresses that their husbands made for them. 
Life revolves around the river. Fishing is a way of life, and they have so many different ways of fishing. They taught us so much how to spear electric eels with arrows, how to spear tukunare. They showed us where turtles hide their eggs. And every day, we all swam in the river where little old ladies were catching little piranhas. We lived pretty much as people have lived for thousands of years. And when you live off the land, there's no separation between yourself and the environment. You're part of the food chain. It's obvious. And this is maybe the most important thing I learned from the Kayapo. But as we left, as we flew out over the rainforest, we saw the many fires that are burning around the periphery of the village. The smoke was so thick, you could stare straight at the sun. It crept in the plain. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this incredible world that I, I had only just discovered existed was being destroyed. And I, I didn't know, of course, the economics or the politics or the reasons behind it. I just knew it was wrong. And, and that flight really changed something for me. I knew I had to do something. And this, again, is the contrast between this amazing beauty and destruction that I mentioned earlier. So when I got back to Canada, I knew I had to do something. I got together with my friends and we started ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization, just basically a group of friends. We wanted to learn about what the issues were, what we could do about it. We started on many local projects, beach cleanups. Um, we ran a series of, new of newsletters for other kids about environmental issues. And after we'd done several local projects, we heard about the Earth Summit that was going to be held in Rio de Janeiro. This was going to be a huge gathering of heads of state to talk about environment and development. And we thought, well, someone should be there to represent the people who are actually going to experience the consequences of these decisions. Echo should go to represent the kids. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> to cut a long story short, my parents thought I was crazy, we ended up raising enough money from our community to send five of us to go to Rio. Once we were there, we had to get our message out. We had to figure out how to get our voices heard. We had a booth at the NGO Forum. Because we were young, we were unusual. People were curious about us. They wanted to know why we were there. And eventually, after two weeks, we got a call from the UN. Someone had dropped out of a plenary session, and we had an hour to get to the conference to be able to address the heads of state. And so we rushed there. <laughs> and I gave my speech. What did I tell them? I told them that I was 12. I told them that I was scared about my future. And I told them that before their duties as politicians or professionals, their first duties were as parents, and that they have to remember their own children when they're making those decisions. Our whole message hinged on the fact that we were 12 and 13 and nine years old, we were children speaking to adults. And there was no other reason for us to be there than pleading for our future. We were appealing as a reminder of the reality that is undeniable. Our current decisions and way of living are neglecting, even robbing our future. They actually take away from the lives of our own children. And that is why people responded to my message, because they couldn't contest this coming from a child or 
at least I got a big round of applause and was invited to a lot of conferences after that. <laughs> but we all know that after Rio, our environmental problems didn't go away. Many things have happened since I visited that Kaiapo village 12 years ago. And I always wanted to return there one day. Through university, I got a fellowship to do research, and I was able to travel to a research station right near that same village of Aogri. And it was incredible to be back after 12 years. I'm very happy to say that the people and the forest is still strong. This is the research station where I lived for two months. We slept in tents in the forest. Myself and Beriberi, who is my Kayapo guide, and <laughs> some of the researchers called them our assistants, but we were absolutely lost in the forest without them. <laughs> he was the same age as me, 21, but came from a, literally a different world. There is so much diversity in the, in the Amazon. It is absolutely incredible. The air is alive with diversity. And this is the other side of diversity. I don't know if you can see my fat lip, probably from one of those butterflies. Human beings are definitely on the food chain. Our lives revolved around the river. This is where we got our water, where we caught our meals, where we swam, where we washed our clothes, and of course, where we caught our piranhas. Fishing is still very much a way of life. The nearest human settlement is Aokri, and life is pretty much the same as it, as it has always been. This is Krut, he's one of the chiefs of the village. People still wear paint for clothing. It's a, it's a dye mixture of genipap seeds. And even we got painted. Actually, I just want to show you. Oh, you can't really see, but the women shave their heads down the center. It's just their tradition. And they also have no, the women and the men have no facial hair. They don't have any eyebrows or eyelashes. So they were always picking up my eyelashes and saying, oh, you'd, you'd be so pretty if only you didn't have eyelashes. <laughs> In fact, all the researchers got painted. They couldn't wait to paint us because they said we were so white and hairy. <laughs> it was so incredible to be studying the forest in a scientific way, in a Western way, yet with the very traditional Kayapo. And I love this photo because you can see Jeff who actually took most of these photos. He was another intern at the research station. Um, he's looking at a little convex mirror to try to gauge how much light there is coming in from the canopy. And Bastion on the left, he's a Kayapo elder, he knows exactly how much light there is. He's looking at it. <laughs> on my last day out in the bush, Beri Beri and I were walking back along the same path that we'd walked every day for, for six weeks. And suddenly we stepped out into sunlight. At first I had no idea what had happened and then we realized what it was was a road. And a road had suddenly been bulldozed straight across our little biological research reserve. We knew that there were illegal loggers who were upstream, and I guess they just needed to get downstream, so they had bulldozed, bulldozed across. And I had the same sense of anger and disbelief as I did when I was nine years old. Though I'd learned a lot since I visited when I was nine, the same issues are still here, the same fragility, 
And actually, in fact, I, I just learned that, I just learned last week that the plans for the dams that Paikan stopped all those years ago are back on the table. Once again, the contrast of incredible diversity and destruction is just so obvious. Sometimes I think that the problems are just too big. They're just too overwhelming. But then I think of the generations of women who marched before me so that I might have equal rights today, so that I might be able to speak to you on this stage today. I think of the activists and the leaders who were fighting so hard for racial equality so that my Japanese dad and my English mom might marry and have a productive family and, and that I might be here. I think of all the mothers and fathers who marched voicing their opinion against nuclear war. I think of all the people who've paved the way for us to be here at this conference, here at Bioneers. And when I think of you all, I remember that each of us has the power to inspire and influence. Each of us influence and teach not only the children in our lives, but we influence and affect everyone we interact with, our family, the people we bump into, the people we work with. And we will, for good or for bad, ultimately influence the future. This is a power that each individual holds. As I read more, as I get older, as I learn more, I have to admit that the world isn't exactly an ethical place. But I also realize that there are people everywhere who are standing up for what they believe, who are, who are speaking out for what they know is right. And the redeeming dichotomy is that out of injustice come, Im come amazing leaders. We've arrived at this point because of brave, dedicated people in the past. We have a responsibility to continue the process towards the future, towards a better way of living. By being here, you are taking on this responsibility. By being here, you are taking a stand. And I'm so glad to have been able to be here this weekend to stand with you. Thank you.